Welcome to The Authority File, the podcast that features conversations about the life cycle of scholarly communication. I'm Bill Mickey, your host and the editorial director at Choice. In this series, we're going to be talking about comic studies, grief, memory, and how all that can be combined into a pretty special piece of creative nonfiction. Joining me on this four-episode series, which is brought to you with generous support from the Wilfrid Laurier University Press, is Dr. Dale Jacobs, a professor of English at the University of Windsor in Windsor, Ontario, and the author of several books, including his latest, On Comics and Grief. The title is a hybrid of scholarship, memoir, nostalgia, and grief over the recent death of the author's mother. It's an encapsulation of how researchers are allowing personal experiences to inform their scholarship and guide the ways in which it is presented. In this third episode of our series, Dale and I talk about the more personal aspects of his title, including how he entwines his scholarship with memories of his mother and father, and why he feels personal experience should definitely be part of the research and writing process. I love the ways you describe the 1976 project in your in your introduction. Um, for example, the Oxford Handbook version, the conference session version, the invited talk version, you know, and even the short personal version. And these were like little sort of isolated uh, excerpts from literally the Oxford Handbook version that you you had written up. You know, why did you pull in these sort of different, uh, I guess? angles uh, as part of your introduction to the book. I think I, I felt like I needed to do that to show the way in which we talk in different registers and different levels of formality and in, in different situations. That's, that's part of it. Uh, and to show that, you know, there are certain situations I can't bring the personal in that, that piece I wrote for the Oxford handbook of comic studies. Right. That's not a place where I could. So I needed that level of formality. Um, the most I disclosed was in that invited talk because that was the sort of most casual atmosphere. Uh, and the short personal, which is just, uh, you know, I wrote this because mom died. Mm. That's where this project comes from. Um, and that's kind of a confession, a kind of confession we don't normally make. Right. And, um, you know, I was struck by, at the time when this started to come together, I was reading a book called My Autobiography of Carson McCullers, where the author is starting out trying to write about Carson McCullers and realizes it's really about her and her relationship with Carson McCullers. And she has a line that says something like, let me show you my relation to the materials. And that mm. line has struck me and stayed with me. And part of what I'm trying to do with this book is show my relation to the materials. And so those different iterations show where I felt like I could and could not disclose. They also are kind of a record of me figuring that out. Because in those first three iterations that were public before, I didn't know that it was about mom. I hadn't mm -hmm. got to that point yet. Right. So you're, you're kind of exposing your, not just the scholarship itself, but your approach to the scholarship and how you arrived at it. Yeah. Yeah, def definitely. That's a lot of what I wanted to do in this book is, you know, the scholarship is important to me and the, you know, the, the material about grief is important to me, but also the relationship between our personal lives and our academic lives and what we study the original article this came out of was the subtitle was uh, why we study what we study. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that's important. Part of what's important to me in this book. Right. So the book includes um, memories of your mother um, and how those memories sort of influence you know, the conclusions, many of the conclusions you're able to pull out of your research. Um, can you talk about how, you know, or what was the catalyst that made you realize this book needed to be written from a broader sort of creative nonfiction scope? Yeah, I, uh, 
as I said, I've, I've been kind of working on this off and on since 2013. And it broadened out from Marvel to being about a year. And I tried lots of ways to formulate an approach, to come up with an approach that felt like was honest and, and something I actually wanted to work on. That's so much of it is if you commit to writing a book, you're committing years of your life. Yeah. And I was trying to figure out what that would be. And I kept circling back to this project. I knew there was something here, but I didn't know what it was. And then uh, I was on sabbatical. He Heidi and I were both on sabbatical in uh, 1920, 2019, 2020, right before the pandemic. And uh, finishing 100 Miles of Baseball. So I was in creative nonfiction mode. And I mm -hmm. remember we were actually cooking dinner and I stopped and I said to her, I have to go to my computer. I'll be back in a few minutes. And I wrote uh, just a paragraph that outlined the initial directions. I realized the reason I couldn't write about this stuff is because it's about mom. Mm. Because looking at the comics of 1976, I'm looking at them because I'm 10 years old in 1976 and mom is still alive. And it's a safe place. And so it's nostalgia and it's grief and it's also a way in. And because I had been thinking and writing about creative nonfiction, I started to think, why can't I combine them? And I had also just read the book on Carson McCullers. So that was in the back of my head. And also in the back of my head was uh, a piece of comic scholarship or, or media studies scholarship in which the person had said, well, here's what's behind what I'm doing, but I'm not going to write about that. And I thought, yeah. why not? Mm. Why, why not? And I, I will. Like, why do we have to cut ourselves off? Why can't that be part of the project? So I, that's how it came to be. And so initially it was an article that I wrote honestly very quickly because it would just came and it combined memories of mom making lefsa with reading comics and as I was 10 and thinking and using a bunch of different approaches to comics. So interdisciplinarity was there from the beginning. I sent it mm -hmm. to Inks. And Kiana Witted, the editor, and Brian Kremens, who was the editor assigned to me, were so helpful and supportive. And Brian is actually the one who said to me, this needs to be a book. Because initially I thought, this is just, this is an article. I still don't know what I'm going to do with this as a book. Yeah, yeah. And it was Brian's encouragement that made me think. And then, you know, I approached uh, Canada Rifkin who's one of the series editors at, at uh, Wilfrid Laurier. And she encouraged me to, to send something in. So I initially sent uh, Siobhan McMenemy the article. Hmm. That's all it was. It was the article saying, I want to expand this out to a book. And that's where it came from. They, and she and Candida and Nora Serrano and uh, Barbara Postema, the, the three series editors, and Siobhan were on board from the beginning. They saw that there was a book in here. Um, and, you know, quickly after that, I sent them an outline of what the whole thing would look like. But that was basically just, here's the 12 months I'm going to do. I didn't quite yet know it was going to be as fragmented as it ended up becoming. Mm -hmm. uh, that happened in the process of, of writing. Doing it. So when we last spoke, it's sort of in a, during a call in preparation for this recording, you, you said something really interesting. Um, you know, thinking through the personal as a way to think of scholarship. And I'm wondering if you could expand on that, you know, sort of the philosophy. What is the philosophy that connects uh, the personal with the scholarship? And, and, but not just that, but, and, and why reveal that? in in the scholarship itself like why take that sort of creative nonfiction approach i think that it's you know i talked about the the piece of comic scholarship that i read sort of around the time where it's henry jenkins and he says this is what's behind it but i'm not going to go into it i think that's so often it's there 
for especially people in the humanities and social sciences to some extent. I think there are reasons we study what we study. Yeah. But we're told don't say what they are. And we're also told not to bring emotion into it. It's just supposed to be analytical, intellectual, but we're we're whole human beings. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to write this partially as a way to say not in every instance, if you're writing for the Oxford Handbook, no, but there is a place for bringing the personal in, for bringing in the reasons we study what we study, for bringing emotion in. But also, I think the personal is a way that potentially yields ways of thinking we wouldn't have got to the the example of from first issue special i wouldn't have got there the mm. ways that i'm able to think about war comics in this i don't think i would have got to without thinking about mom's relationship with her brother who was killed in the second world war hmm. and how that affected her i wouldn't right. have talked about war comics in the same way John, I talk about Johnny Cash, um, a Spire comic, a religious comic about Johnny Cash, his story. I had written about Spire comics before in Graphic Encounters about um, literacy sponsorship. But I hadn't told my own story about being in the Pentecostal church against mom's wishes and the way in which the complicated ways in which both she and I related to Johnny Cash, for example. And so th combining the two let me think about the position of those books and the relationship of those books to their readers in ways that I couldn't have got to without admitting there's a personal element right here. Okay. Um, and just on a little bit more of a practical level, um, you know, I'm just curious, how did you establish the, the writing framework of cutting back and forth between, you know, memories and your, and your scholarly insights into the comics? That's a good question. <laughs> um, it, I think, evolved a little bit as I wrote the book. Uh, every month I knew, here's the two comics I have. I had I had some general note when I wrote my initial outline, I had some notes. Here's some things I want to cover. Like here, I want to cover tryout books. I want to cover X, Y, Z when it comes to comic scholarship and to mm. those particular comics of 1976. But here's also what I want to cover when it comes to the creative nonfiction. So the June chapter, for example, is Two Gun Kid and Richie Rich, Casper and Wendy salute the National League. I paired those two together because I knew I wanted to have one chapter that was actually about dad who passed away five years before mom. Mm -hmm. Dad read Westerns and dad loved baseball. He passed the baseball part on to me. I don't, not the Westerns, but it let me talk about the reading that was in our house. It let me talk about all of those things, but, but it also let me move back and forth between those memories and and that nonfiction with analyzing the comics mm -hmm. as for how they went together it was a lot of it was intuitive okay it's time to switch yeah it's time so initially it was that way and then some things got rearranged in in revision certainly but a lot of it was quite intuitive oh i need a break here oh i'm going to insert text from one of the ads from the comics I'm going to insert text from a uh, hostess ad that uses superheroes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was initially intuitive. You just heard from Dr. Dale Jacobs, an English professor at the University of Windsor and author of the recent book on comics and grief. This episode was brought to you with support from Wilfrid Laurier University Press. Join us next week when Dale and I continue our conversation about how his personal experience and family history informed his book, including how he tied things up in his epilogue. Lastly, Dale provides some outlook on what areas of comic studies are still in need of further investigation. 
As always, underwriting opportunities for the Authority File podcast are directed by Choices Advertising Director Pam Marino, and all of our episodes are produced and edited by Choices Digital Media Producer Sabrina Kofer, with support from Digital Media Assistant Ashley Roy. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.